What's good, ladies and gentlemen? Josh Miss Prime here. You know what it is. Coming at you again today with another episode of Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day man or woman or whatever you identify as. And in this episode, we're going to discuss the similarities and the differences of the everyman hero and the kingly hero. And the you can look at it from a couple different angles, but there's mainly three. There's the storytelling angle. If, if you're someone who's a writer or a storyteller, and everybody is in their own way, whether you're a parent or you're looking for a date or you're trying to sell something to a client, everybody's telling stories. So there's that component to it the surface level, the entertainment level. Then there's the analysis level, which is a little bit more, we'll say scientific. And it, it helps you as a person kind of gain insight into new lessons that you wouldn't have if you didn't look at stories that you consume on a, uh, on a, on a secondary, on a deeper level. And then the third one is the, the life just from the life perspective, many of the storytelling techniques and things that I discuss on this channel revolve around the monomyth, aka the metamyth, aka the hero's journey, and th these components are the reason why they're so important, the reason why you can see them connected into the fabric of humanity is because they play a major role in the development of every human being. So, with that, out of the, with that out of the way, let's get right into it. As many of you know, the hero of a story is many times the main character of the story. And I don't want to get into semantics and I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but there are stories where the main character is not the same as the hero. And there are even stories where the main character is not the protagonist who is not the hero. And, and you know, we could go down that rabbit hole, but we're not going to. Because the key thing is, most stories, the main character and the protagonist, many times, oftentimes, is also the hero. Now, the thing that makes a hero heroic, according to mythology, is, according to the meta myth, is someone who goes from their, their normal world into the unknown world, of magic and adventure and they and while they're there they're giving given an impossible task to go retrieve the boon okay the boon is this this artifact this item that represents the power of the theme of that story they're supposed to retrieve it and then they bring it back into the normal world it's a cycle so if they started here they go into the unknown world then they return back to the normal world with the boon and they they do one of, they have a couple different options they release the positive power of the boon into the world thus revitalizing society or they prevent the negative power of the boon from being released into the world which also revitalizes society or third option they do both and uh, which again revitalizes society but in order to do that, they have to be a vital person. How does someone become a vital person? They must go on this adventure. They must go on the journey and they themselves change internally. Uh, so ultimately that is a hero, okay? I wanna be very clear about what we're discussing because in other literary books and, and maybe uh, you know places that have theory on, on narrative, they'll tell you that a hero is something else. But According to mythology, according to the Metamyth, according to Josh Miss Prime, a hero is somebody who leaves their normal world, retrieves the boon, brings it back to the normal world, and revitalizes society. That is the heroic duty. Nothing else suffices. And the reason why that's so important is because that really helps you identify who is the hero in the story. It also helps you identify when there are stories that, that seem kind of lost, why they're lost. It's because they never truly had a hero or identified the person to carry that torch. Um, maybe they had a protagonist, maybe they had a main character, but they didn't really have a hero. So.
So now that you understand that, well, then the question comes, I've heard the different, I've heard that there are, um, you know, every man heroes and there are kingly heroes. And, and there, you may have even heard that there are even more than that. Like, um, even in one of my books, I have, uh, one of the books that's published right now on archetypes is the iconic hero, which is kind of like the classic hero. And there are variants. There's the anti-hero and stuff like that. But for the purposes of this conversation, the hero archetype is um, the main aspect of it is what I just said about the, the boon and, and revitalizing society. From, from that point, if you were to break it down into... Uh, a, a secondary subclass, it would be the everyman hero and the kingly hero. Now, the everyman hero and the kingly hero, the things that they have in common are that heroic duty and mission. However, the differences are that the everyman hero represents the lower to middle class of society. And when done, when done really well, they show that the that that individual has power to change the world. Okay, it's showing that even the the lowly list, lowliest of people, the the, the 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 most simple of people, think of the Hobbit, or think of Lord of the Rings. Both Frodo Baggins and Bilbo Baggins are perfect examples of this everyman hero. Harry Potter uh, is a really good example of someone who is coming from the working class or the poor class. They're not involved in daily politics. They don't they don't have a lot of power or rule over anybody. They don't have a lot of funds. And so they go on this adventure, but through their actions and their development internally they're able to help revitalize the world nonetheless and that's a very very powerful component and that is why the everyman hero is such uh, a powerful character and I would recommend that if you're going to choose between having an everyman hero or a kingly hero meaning that you're not going to have both uh, I would go with the everyman hero because I mean just by sheer number, you're more likely to relate to a broader audience by doing that. Um, however, my real rec recommendation is that um, when and if possible, to have both. The thing to keep in mind before, I, and I know I'm like, I'm deviating here, but these are all like interconnected aspects when your storytelling is that you want to consider how big is your story. If you have a giant story world that can sustain several different books and several different stories or films or, or whatever your industry is, then having, having two different heroes I think is best because now you're showing you're showing the thematic principles from two different aspects you're showing it from the those people who come from nothing and then you're showing it from people who have power so and that leads us directly into the next point which is the kingly hero in contrast to the everyman hero is someone who comes from uh, an upper class lineage they for whatever reason have some type of power they uh, usually political governmental monetary and usually um, there this is the, it's in the beginning this person starts out as somewhat pompous somewhat arrogant somewhat um, cocky and then through the course of the journey they learn that um, real kingliness 
comes through servitude and humility and and genuineness. And so one of the oldest, it's raining again, one of the oldest stories in mankind is actually about, it's called the, um, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh is like this. He, he's a king. He's kind of pompous. He builds a lot of buildings for his own glory. He has his people do it. And um, then he meets this character who I, I believe represents the everyman hero, which is Enkidu. And Enkidu is like this woodsy guy that lives out in the forest, but he's super strong and they kind of, they're both equal in strength. Now, some people might say Enkidu is more like the, an ally. And, and I, I would agree to some extent, but just hear me out. In this particular um, story, Enkidu ends up dying towards the end and it's a real, well, sorry. So I, what, I, what I failed to say is Gilgamesh and Enkidu, when they first meet, they don't like each other. They kind of have a fight, they wrestle. Um, but to Gilgamesh's surprise, like Enkidu is, is strong like him and can hold his own and eventually they become friends and they go on this adventure and then they're basically looking for the elixir of life, the elixir to immortality. And uh, at the end, not to ruin it, but Enkidu ends up dying. And this is a major loss for Gilgamesh, who's finally changed internally. And it really weighs on him, even when he gets back to society. And the um, he fails to bring the the tr the elixir of immortality back to society, but. What he learns, and this is the positive power of the boon, what he learns is that true kingliness is by serving others, and true Im immortality is not found in the things that you build for your own glory, but the deeds that you do in service of the community, in service of the society. And so you can see how a lesson like that is very important for those people in the upper class echelons to learn because they're the ones that have the power and resources to make a real change sometimes. But they often have the same flaw that Gilgamesh did. And, um, but he's, he's only one example. It, as, as I mentioned before, if we look at the everyman in Lord of the Rings, you have Frodo. In The Hobbit, you have Bilbo Baggins. You also have kingly heroes. In Lord of the Rings, you have Aragorn. And in The Hobbit, you have Thorin Oakenshield. And both of them go on a very similar kingly adventure where they earn the right to be the king of their people. And for Aragorn, it is, it is by abstaining from the normal temptations that man has towards power and, and also taking a stand even though uh, you would rather be passive in a sense. And then for Thorin, Thorin has a bit of a tragic arc but in the end he redeems himself because he ends up sacrificing himself to kill Azog the pale orc and 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 save his people from the the negative aspect of the boon which would be you know allowing the the orcs to take over their land and and kill all of them and stuff like that so that that in a nutshell there you have several different aspects of the difference between an everyman hero and a kingly hero. And so, so then the question is, okay, well, what about an everyman or every woman heroine and a queenly heroine? And I would say that it, they follow the same premise. 
uh, in terms of the, the, the every woman heroine is going to symbolize the lower to middle class echelons and then the queenly heroine is going to symbolize the upper class of your story world but also you know real life and um, there are differences there are major differences between the hero and the heroine in terms of the hero is a servant of nature is a servant of life but cannot produce it on their own the heroine however is a vessel of life and therefore life itself and so where the heroes the heroes duty in a sense is to serve life the heroine's duty is to give life and uh, Katniss Everdeen is a good example but she's more of a she's an everyman heroine uh, Let's see. A good example of a kingly hero, or sorry, a queenly heroine, would be Arwen from Lord of the Rings, and to a lesser extent, um, oh shucks, I can't remember her name. But in the Hobbit, at least in the films, Peter Jackson added uh, the female elf, whose name is escaping me right now, but. She kind of has like a love interest with one of the dwarves and Legolas kind of has a thing for her too. Um, but I can't remember her name off the top of my head. It's, it's escaping me right now. So there you go. Um, and just, and it, that's another thing too. Like when you look at the Lord of the Rings is a really good example when doing a case study on these kind of heroes because it did a really good job, Tolkien did a really good job of creating characters and races that symbolized all this stuff. So you have um, the hobbits who basically s characterize and, and, and reflect the lower class to middle class, I would really say lower class, of people who just live simple lives, who aren't involved in everyday politics, they're very distant from the major uh, issues of the world from war and they just they they do they live simple like farmer kind of lives whereas on the flip side you have places like Gondor which is like almost always on the brink of war because it's right next to Mordor and it those are men and they have completely different attributes from, while they might be similar, they're completely different attributes from hobbits. Hobbits don't care about power. They're not, they're not politically inclined. Whereas we see with the, the human factions, Rohan and Gondor and some of the characters that are in the sub-factions, uh, they, they have much more inclinations towards war, towards politics, towards power, towards greed. And that those are symbolic of the, the not just different races in, in like a in in terms of like where people live, but different social classes. And the elves would be what I would consider, especially like the high elves. These are like people who come from old money, and and so like maybe in the you know. 200 years ago these were families with wealth but even though they don't they're they're not really in the uh, you know the royal family is a good example of this of what like the elf race represents it's like these were people who were in power at one time and were much more connected to the world but now they're out even though they still have their wealth their names are still have meaning but they're kind of more behind the scenes they don't interact with everyday life. And so that's a really good example of different races representing different uh, social classes. And then within that those races, you have characters that represent a certain type of person. And I mentioned this in my 
my course, um, Thematic Residence, Resonance, where when you're creating the theme of your story, you gotta start with your hero, because your hero represents the ego, your hero represents the audience. So you ask yourself, the very first question you ask yourself, who am I writing this for? Who is the person, like what do they wear, What are they, where do they hang out, what do they do, that is going to read this book and love it? And then from there you kind of build on top of that. So if you're writing a story about a dude who comes from old wealth and spend, he's a trust fund baby and he spends a lot of time, or maybe it's a girl, they spend a lot of time <clears throat> in um, you know, high-end clubs on the, on the weeknights and their friends have yachts and they do, like that's a completely different type of person and lifestyle than if you were writing the story for a dude who grew up in like, I'm, I'm just picking me now, like in the 80s and 90s in the middle class, played a lot of video games, maybe did a little bit of sports, hangs out at like, you know, mid-level bars, the, that, that when you start to think about that, then you can already imagine where does your character work, what problems do they face, what issues do they have, what's preventing them from reaching their fullest potential, that's where you start to build. And, um, and again, like my big recommendation is if you have a story that's large enough to support, uh, you know, a, a lot of characters and the bigger, the bigger the world and the more the story you're, you're willing to write, the, the larger you can go, then I would have a, an everyman hero and a kingly hero. And I would even go so far as to create an in every woman hero and a queenly hero. And this is where, you know, it's up to you. Um, in my in my mind, in Game of Thrones, Jon Snow is the, he is the everyman hero. And the reason why I say he's everyman hero, he did kind of grow up with royalty and the case could be made that he's the kingly hero. And, and I'm not saying he's the only everyman hero, but um, actually, you know what? I, I'm, I'm going to already recant that. He is the kingly hero. But on the flip side, so he's the kingly hero that has to earn his right to be the king of the lands, which I don't think the ending did a good job of that, but that's a whole other conversation. On the flip side, we meet the queenly hero at the same time who is Daenerys. And we meet them both when they're younger, and then we see them grow up. Now, Daenerys has a tragic arc unfortunately, and we see her basically lead herself into ruin. Again, not the most well executed, but it did make sense to me. And, it, and I feel like it also provided a very good lesson for uh, that, like that character provides a very good thematic lesson for society. Um, and my point in bringing those up are, you could have a story world where if it's large like Game of Thrones or it's large like Lord of the Rings or Star Wars or something like that where you can have all four of these characters and they all have their own stories that eventually converge in different ways. And, and in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, they've done this maybe not with queenly heroes, I, I don't think, um, as well. But like there's multiple kingly and, and everyman heroes that their stories converge, particularly in Endgame um, and in Infinity War and Endgame. But um, that my recommendation is if you do that, you're covering all your bases. And then especially if you have that and maybe one or two tragic heroes and you could add it like they could be in addition to it could be like. You have your four base ones, and then you have two tragic. Maybe one is a everyman, and one is a a queenly hero, or something like that. Then you can kind of the benefit of tragic heroes is that they they don't learn from the psychological truth, and therefore they fall into their psychological flaw, which ultimately becomes their fatal flaw and leads them into tragedy. 
And so it's like a good, a lot of, you know, just like with Shakespeare plays, tragic heroes um, serve as a good lesson in what not to do with your life and, and just for society in general. So hopefully I'm just trying to think, you know, does that, I think that that gives a pretty good idea from various different angles of like, you know, what are those differences when you're writing them? Um, and in contrast to what I said before, the smaller your story, the more you want to condense this. You want to have less characters. You want to have less scenes. You want to have less stages. In some short stories, you may only be exploring a couple steps within a particular stage of the meta myth. Or, you know, maybe it's just one scene and they, you only have one or two characters in there. Um, that That's, of course, up to you and how much you plan on writing and what your intent was when you went into the story. But the point is, you, you, you base it off of the size and scope of the story and then who you have. So if you have a much smaller story, like say a, no, no, a novella or shorter, I would keep it to one hero or one heroine and then your then your option is you can either go with a hero or heroine that has the attributes of both a kingly hero and an everyman hero or <coughs> you can you can just pick one and stick with it an example of a character that has the attributes of both an everyman hero and a kingly hero would be Luke Skywalker. And to a lesser extent, I would say Harry Potter. Um, and the reason is they were raised and brought up in a everyman environment, but they have the lineage of this upper class individual that's of significant importance to the to the, the, the story world's government and politics later on when they, as they discover this. And so this is where an everyman hero starts out like that and then over the course of the story or a couple different you know episodes transitions into the kingly hero. And that, that's also quite possible. Um, when this happens, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna, I'll leave you with this, and the, like I know I'm giving you a ton, but it's a, it's good information. When this happens, and you have a condensed story where you're not gonna have all four of the main hero archetypes in there, you you can have like uh, what's the word I'm looking for? You can have substitutes. For, for those characters. So in a, in a story that's about an everyman, if they don't meet up with a kingly hero like Frodo does with Aragorn, then another option that can happen is that they the everyman meets up with the big brother, which is essentially the substitute archetype ally for the kingly hero and Star Wars is another good example Luke starts out as the everyman but because he's going to turn into the kingly hero when he meets when he's in that stage where it makes the most sense to meet the kingly hero he actually meets the big brother which is Han Solo and Han Solo is is an anti-hero uh, which is another you know good example he's a I could go on and on. Like there are so many renditions and, and options of this, but I think by now you're starting get, to get the point and at a minimum you understand the similarities and the differences between the everyman hero and the kingly hero and their female counterparts. So with that being said, I'm going to bounce out. This has been Josh Coker, AKA Josh Miss Prime. And if you want to learn more, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, Polymathics. Um, constantly hitting you guys up with information on how to become a modern day renaissance man and or woman. 
And uh, yeah, that's it. All right, take it easy.